Okay, I think uh, we could start now. Here is uh, Georg Kostner speaking uh, from uh, Wirt Phoenix. I'm uh, responsible for the business unit system integration. And today I'm glad and happy to introduce the, the, the topic uh, cybersecurity with uh, Antop. Uh, Antop is a long cooperation now over 10 years we have with the Antop team. And Antop is also one of our core technology for network visibility and now also for cybersecurity topics from the network point of view. And so I hope everybody will uh, uh, enjoy this webinar and the presentation of our NTOP colleagues. If during the presentation or some question, please feel free to hand uh, your hand with the uh, Teams uh, functionality or drop uh, write a question in the chat. So I will uh, to not uh, to give the colleagues of Antop the time to present uh, in detail uh, their vision about cybersecurity. I will pass uh, to Simone uh, now, and thanks to Simone and Alfredo for giving this presentation to all of us. So please, Simone, it's your turn. All right, thanks for this introduction, Georg. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to give this uh, webinar together with uh, Phoenix, our long-term partner. And yes, I am Simone Mainardi, and together with my colleague Alfredo Cardigliano, I'm going to talk to you about how to identify and mitigate attacks with uh, a couple of uh, our software called Antop NG and Scrap. So let's start with the uh, agenda. I would like to begin this presentation with an introduction and motivation. So basically, we are going to see uh, the shift that has been occurring from traditional to security-centric traffic analysis tools. We are also going to see how to form a distributed security-oriented traffic analysis, threat intelligence, and perimeter protection. Then, by means of real use cases, we are going to see the threat intelligence using NTOPNG and how to protect the perimeter of a, of a corporate network using NSCRA. Finally, we are going to conclude this presentation with uh, some recommendation, a take-home message, and a, an announcement of a new workshop. Okay, let's start this presentation. You know that protecting against cyber attacks is becoming a top priority all around the world. And the first step to, to reach the protection is to be able to identify attacks. So this has created a demand in the market for traditional traffic analysis tools to evolve and become security-centric security focused. This is on the one hand. On the other hand, we have seen new security tools appearing in the market and offering identification, protection, and mitigation against threats, against attacks that were basically unknown until a few years ago. So what does it mean to what does this shift mean? So, what does it mean to shift from a traditional to a security-centric traffic analysis? Well, this means that in addition to traditional monitoring, traditional metrics such as, I don't know, latency monitoring, round-trip time, service availability, 
campaigns that is basically traditional metrics that are useful for the quality of service, quality of experience, and user experience. Existing security, existing traffic analysis tools have, have now started to be more focused toward the security. So they are adding to the traditional metrics, new metrics that are focused on security. And among the new challenges that we, we have been seeing, we, we can find the analysis of the encrypted traffic, also known as ATA, or we have the detection of vulnerable protocols or unsafe ciphers. For example, if you are using uh, weak encryptions, or if you are using old protocols like SMB V1, we also have, among the new challenges, the ability to have visibility on all the devices in a corporate network. Devices that are more and more also IoT. This means that you have cameras, IP cameras, badge readers, temperature sensors, moist sensors, humidity sensors. A lot of IoT devices that are now if I would say, that are now omnipresent in corporate networks. And they typically tend to be vulnerable because they are very low-end devices, seldomly updated, so they tend to be vulnerable. So we must take a lot of care in analyzing their traffic and in making sure they are secure. And finally, uh, among the new challenges, it is worth mentioning the timely identification to anticipate and prevent attacks to become disruptive. This means that even if I am the victim of an attack, I must have security tools that are able to anticipate and to stop the attack as soon as possible before the attack becomes disruptive. So let's have a look at the evolution of cyber security over the years. As we see from this slide, we have the cyber security that started with very, very basic activities such as asset inventory and access control up to the anticipation that is the anomaly and the threat intelligence. So being able again to anticipate and react to the threats. So, what are the requirements to implement and to operate uh, a traffic analysis that is security-centric? Well, first of all, we should be able to do the so-called distributed traffic analysis. We are going to see these in detail now in, in this presentation, but basically we will have to, to perform the analysis of traffic in a distributed way. That is having many probes on the edges of the network and a central point with the intelligence, with the intelligence that is able to correlate and combine data from multiple probes, from multiple vantage points. It is also necessary to perform the so-called deep network traffic dissection. That is, we need tools that are able to inspect the real traffic packets deep, very deep down until the layer seven and be also able to analyze the encrypted traffic, which does not mean to decrypt it. It means to analyze and to extract relevant metrics from the encrypted traffic. And we are going to see examples of this in this presentation. Among the requirements, we also have the ability to correlate the raw data and create alarms 
that you can use to react and to prevent issues from being disrupted. And you also want to have pools that are open, that are able to export data towards downstream recipient, for example, an Elasticsearch instance or other technologies that may be already existing in corporate environments. And finally, it's also necessary and it's also good to be able to protect the perimeter of an infrastructure, the perimeter of a corporate network, to protect from the volumetric attacks that might be arriving from the internet. Okay, so let's see with a bit more detail all these, these requirements. I mentioned uh, distributed traffic analysis. So how does it look like to perform a distributed traffic analysis? Well, imagine that um, today networks are likely distributed. So it is likely to have geographical networks distributed between multiple branches, or even if you consider the 5G network or IoT networks uh, where you can monitor a wine yard or you can monitor an oil and gas plant. Typically, networks are distributed geographically today. So it means that you need to deploy multiple probes on the edges of the network. So you need to have multiple vantage points to look at your network from multiple perspectives. You need to implement some logic for the analysis on the edges, and then you have to have the edges that are able to digest the traffic and send the traffic toward a central point. So using our technologies, using our software, on the remote edges of the network, we can use the end probes. And on the central point of the network, we can use the end OpenG, which is basically, it contains the threat intelligence and is able to correlate and combine data coming from multiple probes into actionable insights. So what is the job of those remote probes distributed in, in the network? Well, they perform the so-called deep network traffic inspection. This network traffic dissection is basically composed of three different layers that are packet capture, deep packet inspection, and flow processing. So to perform this activity, our end probe integrates an open source library for deep packet inspection that decodes the raw traffic packets and is able to detect the issues that could be hidden into the payload of these traffic packets. So this deep packet inspection library contains enough intelligence to detect possibly malicious traffic activities. And among these malicious traffic activities, we find, for example, TLS vulnerabilities, such as the use of self-signed certificates or weak ciphers or obsolete versions of the TLS, or we, we also detect cross-site scripting attempt or SQL injection, just to name a few. Then we have a part which is reserved for the analysis of the HTTP traffic, so basically, this deep packet inspection library integrated in the remote probes is able to inspect the traffic packets and detect this kind of risks. However, this library per se is not enough, is not necessary to, to actually 
find the, to actually give you the big picture, to actually give you enough intelligence to understand what's going on. You need to correlate and combine these data into something which gives you the overview, which gives you the big picture of what is happening in your network. So for this, you can use the NTOPNG. So NTOPNG, as we have seen before, is able to receive the data from all the distributed probes in the network, correlate this data with additional information such as SNMP data or alerts from Suricata or blacklists and autonomous system data is able to correlate everything together to give you an overview, to give you a high level overview of what is happening in your network. And it's not only able to find the issues, but it's also able to react and respond to the issues. For example, by blocking certain malicious hosts from doing extra traffic. And we are going to see examples of this later in this presentation. So to have an overview of uh, the activity of NTOPNG, we can take this picture. Because, you know, NTOPNG is already integrated in, Net in NetEye, so it's pretty easy for you just to, to try and operate it. So basically, NTOPNG receives data from the probes, correlates data with SNMP, Suricata, and other, and other technologies, and it emits the intelligence towards multiple downstream resilience. It can be Elasticsearch, various databases, various messaging systems such as Slack, Discord, Telegram, and, and, and so on. So uh, finally, among these, uh, among the requirements, if you want to protect against threats that are coming from the outside, that are coming from the internet, you can uh, consider operating a distributed denial of service mitigator, which stays between the internet and your corporate network, to basically mitigate the known volumetric attacks, also known as distributed denial of service. So if we, to, to give you just a, a big picture of what a complete environment, of what a complete deployment it can be on your corporate network, it can be something like this. So you have your corporate network with multiple and probes distributed in your corporate network sending data to NTOPNG for the intelligence and the analysis. And you have also the end scrap between your corporate network and the internet to protect from the threats that are coming from the outside. So visibility of your network from the inside and protection of your network from the outside. This is the big picture that you can achieve using NetEye and the tools that are shipped with NetEye. So this concludes basically the first part of the presentation, the introduction, and I would like to show you real examples of the threat intelligence of what uh, we can do with uh, what we can do using NTOPNG in combination with, uh, with NTOP. I mentioned the analysis of encrypted traffic. So I would like to spend some minutes to give you some pointers and details of what it means to perform the analysis of the encrypted traffic. Analyzing encrypted traffic does not mean to decrypt the traffic. We do not really believe that traffic decryption is a is a feasible or viable way to it's it's feasible or viable you know maybe there are ssl inspectors there are products but 
it's pretty easy to circumvent their activities and there are many reasons that, I mean, there are many reasons behind the unfeasibility of doing the decryption of uh, TLS traffic. So encrypted traffic analysis means being able to analyze the encrypted traffic without decrypting, decrypting it. For example, when it comes to the analysis of TLS, we can analyze and inspect all the TLS handshake. The TLS handshake contains a rich set of information that gives us clues of what that encrypted session is about. So we can extract the certificate names, we can extract the, the, the ciphers used for that encrypted communication, we can extract the application protocol carried inside the encrypted communication and so on. So using this metadata, we are able to detect certain risks and possible security risks associated with the encrypted traffic. And let me just give you some examples of the encrypted traffic analysis. First of all, we can start with the use of unsafe ciphers. What does it mean to use unsafe ciphers? Well, ciphers are basically algorithms that are used to encrypt the data into the TLS communication. Using unsafe ciphers means that the algorithms used are not strong enough, are reasonably easy to be decrypted, basically. So if in your infrastructure, if in your network, there are TLS clients or servers using versions of the TLS that are old, it's likely that they can be using unsafe ciphers. So this is a potentially a security risk for your encrypted communication because an eavesdropper or someone can intercept and decrypt the communications that are not safe. And indeed, in top and G, by inspecting the encrypted communication is able, as we can see in this slide, to tell you unsafe TLS ciphers used. So you know that you have a communication that is using unsafe TLS cipher. This is a real example that I have generated just by reaching an, Itali an Italian government site. So basically an Italian government site is using unsafe TLS ciphers just to serve us with, uh, with data. Another interesting thing that we can extract from the encrypted traffic is the, you know, the old known ALPN, which is the application layer protocol negotiation. So this ALPN is just a TLS extension used to negotiate the application protocol carried inside the TLS. So just by looking at this information, that travels unencrypted in the TLS handshake, we are able to reasonably guess the application layer protocol that is carried inside the encrypted communication. And this is very relevant from a security point of view because it's very useful to respond to questions such as, what is the nature of this communication? Is this TLS session used by a web application? Is this a TLS session used to carry HTTP or HTTPS? Or is it carrying something else? This is very useful because it, it can be used as an indicator to spot VPNs in the wild. That is VPNs that are using TLS without carrying HTTP. So maybe using this indicator, you may be able to spot suspicious encrypted communication, such as VPNs that are taking place in your corporate network. 
And indeed, and TopNG is able to create an alert on these events as well. And as we see from this slide, we see that a flow is alerted and EntopNG is telling us this TLS session is probably not carrying HTTPS. Again, we also, for, for the encrypted traffic analysis, it is also worth mentioning the analysis of the server name indication, so the SNI. The SNI is basically the equivalent of the host header in HTTP for those of you that are familiar with HTTP. That is basically a string which carries the server name that is going to be contacted over that TLS section. This means that if I type HTTPS facebook.com in my web browser, this string facebook.com travels unencrypted into the TLS header as part of the server name indication. Therefore, even if your communication with Facebook is encrypted, the fact that you are visiting facebook.com travels unencrypted in the TLS handshake. So it's possible to guess the activity that is being performed into that TLS session just by looking at the server name indication. The server name indication in TLS 1.3 can be encrypted. So there is an extension of the TLS 1.3 for the encryption of the server name indication, which is not that used, at least uh, for now it's not that used, but still, and TopNG is able to tell you if uh, the server name indication is used, is encrypted, is not encrypted, and what is that server name indication about? Is about. In this example, we have a TLS communication which is missing the TLS as an I. So it's, it's a potentially suspicious activity to have a missing TLS as an I because, I mean, it, it could be someone who is probing a TLS server just with empty TLS as an I. So it's worth, it's worth inspecting this kind of uh, potentially suspicious activities. So this concludes basically the part related to the encrypted traffic analysis. And I would like now to spend a couple of slides discussing the analysis of periodic traffic. Because, you know, traditionally, uh, Traffic analysis have uh, focused on the elephants, that is on the top X. You want to know the top senders, the top talkers, the top protocols, top whatever. This is interesting from a traditional traffic analysis perspective. But from a security perspective, it's not that relevant for the elephants to be studied and analyzed it. because typically from a security perspective the issues can stay in the so-called mice the issues can stay in the very small flows generating generating very low bandwidth periodically and that can be easily easily confused and mixed with the noise for example there are many malware around in the wild that are just, for example, the botnets are malware that have a periodic behavior. So malware that generates a very low amount of traffic periodically. So doing an analysis of the top senders of top receiver, receivers would be totally unuseful for these. So we need the tool to analyze the low bandwidth traffic that can be periodic. And indeed, and TopNG features the analysis of periodic low bandwidth connection. It means that it listens at the traffic 
and it is able to detect the periodic activities that are taking place on your network on, on a given host. Here we have an example of an host doing, of an host Lucas iMac doing periodic activities such as using Dropbox, Spotify, or Cloudflare. And you see the frequency of these periodic activities here in this table. So this is a legitimate use of an host, but if you see here a protocol which is not known, but it says unknown, and you see a periodic behavior, periodic unknown activities for unknown protocols, that is something potentially suspicious, and that is worth analyzing with more detail. So periodic traffic analysis is, again, one extra thing featured by NTOPMG to understand the periodic pattern possibly suspicious activities among the low bandwidth connections of your network. Also, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction of this presentation, it's very relevant to focus now on IoTs because IoT devices are pervasive. So the latest uh, NDPI and the latest NTOPNG features the analysis of IoT and industrial IoT protocols, such as the DNP3 and the EEC. These, those protocols are used, especially in the industry, to, to, to realize communication networks between, uh, between smart devices. And then TopNG is able to dissect and analyze these kind of um, protocols as well. So industrial IoT and SCADA. And least, but not last, I would like to show you how NTOPNG can be used not only as a mere generator of insights, not only as a mere threat intelligence tool, but I would like to show you how to use NTOPNG to actually react and protect against an attack. So how can NTOPNG protect you against an attack? NTOPNG implements uh, an indicator of compromise, which we have called SCORE. That is basically a number, so that the higher this number, the higher the chance of that particular host to be malicious or compromised. So NTOPNG keeps this number updated for all the hosts that are monitored. And every time it detects a suspicious activity, such as the use of, uh, of the TLS, a bad use of TLS or the periodic activities, it keeps increasing this host score. And eventually what happens? It happens that, again, the higher the score associated to an host, the higher the chance for this host to be compromised. Maybe this host can be part of a botnet or, or, or something else. So how can an NTOPNG react to this kind of behavior? Well, the reaction in this example is Thanks to the correlation of traffic data with SNMP data, NTOPNG knows the switch and the port where the malicious host is connected to, and it can trigger and actually physically turn the SNMP port off. So basically, when a, a suspicious or malicious host is detected in the network, NTOPNG is able not only to detect and create an alert on this host, but is also able to physically disconnect it from the network. So actually preventing it from being disruptive and from creating more issues and more problems to the network itself. So the threat detection in NTOPNG uh, now we have just seen uh, some examples, but there are many, many more examples of uh, threat detection using NTOPNG. So you, 
you can detect data exfiltration, you can detect DNS abuse. There are many, many other, other threat indicators that are implemented using Lua scripts. This means that it's pretty easy to extend and open G with new scripts, new detection mechanisms. So you, you can just take this NTOPNG and create your own script to implement new logic and new detection algorithms in a pretty, pretty simple way. And yes, that I mentioned also that it was, it, it's important for a threat intelligence tool to be able to export intelligence towards downstream recycling because in your corporate network, you might have databases already in place, you might have messaging systems, mails, and whatever, and you want to receive threats indicators directly on those channels that, that are already in place, that, uh, that exist already. So in the latest NTOPNG, we have designed a, a flexible way to deliver alerts, to deliver threats indicators towards multiple recyclants. And we use to do this both severity-based criteria and type-based criteria. This means that you can send security-related alerts towards an Elasticsearch instance, which is managed by the security team. And at the same time, you can send network-related alerts via email towards the team that is managing the network. And you can do this in a pretty fine-grained way. So among the downstream recipients we support, we have this alert. Elasticsearch, Slack, Telegram, email, Sizzler, Webhook. And it, since those downstream recipients are implemented using Lua script, it is also pretty easy to extend and create new recipients when needed. This is just to show you an example to have a couple of recipients. See, I have one recipient for the security team Discord. And in the drop down, I've chosen security only alerts. Then I have also another recipient called network team email, where I've chosen as the category for alerts only the network. So from this point on, and TopNG will start analyzing the traffic and will deliver security alerts to the security team via Discord, and will deliver network alerts to the network team via email. So this concludes basically the second part of the presentation with the thread intelligence and the export of alerts toward downstream recycling. So I would like now to let my colleague Alfredo talk you about the perimeter protection of your infrastructure using the end scrub. So please, Alfredo. Yeah, thank you, Simone. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? No. Mm, let me try again. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so um, so we have seen how NTOPNG can be used not just to do traditional traffic analysis, but also to analyze encrypted traffic, identify security threats and um, unexpected behaviors in our network, and also notify with alerts to react to, to the detected issues. Uh, but we also need to protect our network from external attacks, so to protect the perimeter. Uh, so I want to talk about 
distributed denial of services. Uh, this is another category of cyber attacks um, with the goal of make, uh, making a service unavailable, not just destroying some data in our network, stealing data or compromising data or devices. And those attacks are distributed attacks coming from compromised devices over the internet, a huge amount of device, devices. Typically, in the last years, those devices are IoT devices, and the number of IoT devices is exploding. Why IoT devices? Because they are usually mm, many, first of all, and they're usually mm, not configured properly. They usually have the default username and password to, to log in, and they have weak, let's say, operating system implementations. So they can be really used to, to, to run attacks uh, easily. Uh, we have seen that AntopNG can detect anomalous traffic, they can detect a command and control, for instance, uh, or abnormal traffic, compromised devices. So it can detect if someone is using our network, for instance, for doing something like running attacks. But we also need to protect ourselves from attacks. Um, so how we safe? Mm, if you look at some statistics, we can see that uh, in, in last year um, we have seen more than eight million attacks, and this number is growing, growing doubling actually every four years in average. Um, half of those attacks have been successful, and we can see how the attacks are growing in this picture. So the attacks are exceeding two, three terabits per second. So they are moving, they are volumetric attacks. They are moving a lot of data over the internet, attacking a victim. Uh, this US is actually a business. In fact, if you Google, if you search on Google, you can find many services. If you look for booter or stressor, you can find many services uh, that you can pay to launch attacks. They, they are, um, I mean, the, <clears throat> they say that they use this service to test your network, but actually they can be used to attack other networks, not just your network. And there is a huge imbalance between the cost of those attacks, which is usually a few euros. So you can attack a web server for 10, 20 euros, um, versus the damage that those attacks uh, can cause to the victim for outages, and as a consequence of this loss of user trust. So if you're running an awesome provider, your user expects that the service is up 24-7, but uh, if you receive an attack and your service goes down, which is the goal of the DDoS attack, then you have a loss of the user trust. So what is a DDoS attack in, attack in practice? Uh, there are many devices over the internet generating traffic, uh, targeting uh, a victim that can be a web server, uh, a network. Um, and those attacks usually try to uh, exhaust the resources of the victim, bringing the victim down, or uh, they also hit before the victim, also other devices in the middle, like security devices, firewalls, intrusion prevention systems, or routers, or they can even saturate the internet link. So in this case, a legitimate, legitimate user, which is trying to use your service, is not able to do that because your victim is down, or other devices in the middle are down, or your internet link is saturated. There are many actor vectors. I don't want to list all of them, but just to mention a few, you probably heard about the scene fluid, uh, amplification attacks, usually based on UDP, IS, ISMP, or we, can, we see a lot of DNS-based uh, amplification attacks. So they send a spoofed request to a DNS server, which is not verifying the source. 
with small requests, they produce big response towards the victim, uh, overwhelming the victim with a lot of traffic, uh, filling the, the internet link. And um, we can see other attacks, there are many, but I can mention IP fragmentation, uh, slow attacks, or up to layer seven attacks, which are targeting to specific uh, resources on the service uh, at layer seven, which has well known to use a lot of resources uh, in order to, to really bring down the service. I guess that many of you heard about the DIN DNS attack in 2016. Uh, this affected many services, uh, bringing down many services over the internet. Uh, this attack was the biggest ever seen at the time. It moved more than one terabit per second of data. And the, the let's say behind this attack, there was a botnet, Mirai, uh, consisting of 10 million of compromised devices. Most of those devices were IoT devices and routers. This botnet was implementing many attack vectors. I don't want to focus on all of them, but I want to show you the big picture. So what is the architecture of a botnet? So the core of a botnet is a, a many, let's say, compromised devices. As I said, usually IoT devices. Those devices can be in your network, they can be compromised devices. That, um, those devices are, uh, are the devices which are running the attack itself. So they are generating traffic towards the victim or towards the reflector servers. And they also scan the network to find other devices to be part of the botnet. And then we have the command and control server, which is instructing the devices to, uh, with uh, commands for generating the attack itself. And we have other, other actors like the, the master of the botnet, the DDS for IL, which is actually the, the stressor service that we have seen before, um, where the customer is paying and buying attacks towards the victim. So if we could focus on the botnet nodes, we have seen that if we have compromised device in our network. We are able to detect them using EntopNG. So EntopNG can be used to check for uh, periodicity, uh, as we have seen, for long-lived flows, and a lot of activities that can you know, trigger an alarm, and we can check the device. And at the same time, but in this case, um, let's say we are, we may be part of the botnet, so we have compromised device that can be used to, to, to run an attack, but we can also be the target of the attack. In that case, we need uh, what we call a DDoS mitigator, so a device which is filtering the traffic coming from outside uh, to discard bad traffic and let just legitimate traffic through to our network. So as I said, the main goal of the DS mitigator is to make sure that, uh, first of all, the service is able to stay up and that a legitimate user is able to reach the service and use the service, and just the bad traffic should be discarded. This is an example that summarized what, what I said. So in this example, this is a chart from our DDS mitigator and scrub. And as you can see, we have um, our, uh, let's say, peace time traffic, which is 100 to 100 megabits per second. And, and scrub, so the, the DDS mitigator forwards the traffic from the one interface to our internal network. At some point, the traffic received from the one interface, which is the red line, uh, exceeds a certain threshold, or uh, scrub the mitigator detects that there is uh, some anomaly in the traffic, like, I don't know, the TCP flex distribution, there are many algorithms for that, and starts engaging the algorithms for filtering this traffic. 
So we, we see that the traffic which is forwarded to, to the LAN interface, which is the pink traffic, uh, at some point, uh, is, is, uh, the mitigator is starting to filter this traffic. So the, pink tra the traffic in the pink line is not exceeding, I don't know, 300 megabits per second, and it's starting discarding the traffic, which is the green line. So this is how a mitigator should work. Should discard the bad traffic and forward the good traffic. So Scrub, as I said, is our DDS mitigation system. Uh, it works as a bump in the wires or as a transparent bridge and or as a router. As a bump in the wire, it doesn't require any special configuration because you just plug it in the middle of your network before your firewall to protect your firewall, so all your security devices and your network. Um, it implements algorithms which are able to detect uh, bad traffic, so to understand if some traffic is legitimate, real traffic, or generated by a botnet, and filter this traffic. And it can work on commodity hardware, so it can work on Stardar, Dell, Xeon systems, with, I don't know, Intel interfaces. Uh, it implements many protection mechanisms that we will list later in this presentation. And it can also be extended by means of plugins with the definition of new algorithms. That means that if you're running a specific, a special service, I don't know, a game server, you want to write your plugin for checking the traffic, you can uh, do that defining a custom plugin that works in addition to the built-in protection mechanisms in Nscrub. So this is the architecture. So Nscrub is sitting in the middle between the LAN and the WAN interface. Uh, Nscrub provides a simple web-based interface for providing some visibility about the attacks. Uh, you can configure Nscrub using a RESTful API or a console to inject the protection policies if you want to change the configuration. Uh, of course, it supports statistics, it keeps some historical data with statistics, and is able to trigger alerts to notify when something happens. Um, it's possible also to, to... There are a few notification scripts, for instance, is able to send emails, uh, notifications on Slack or webhook, but you can write your, I don't know, bash scripts, for instance, to add more notifications. This is the, this part of the web interface of Nscrub. This is an example of the traffic analysis under attack. Uh, we can see uh, the traffic in the packet rate, the bit rate, you can see the protocol distribution. In this case, this, is a, this was a TCP attack. We can see the flex distribution. So we see that uh, this was a scene fluid because uh, we see the, the scene blue line. But we can also integrate Nscrub with NTOPNG. So Nscrub is able to send uh, traffic using sampling to a virtual interface where uh, EntopNG is listening, so that you can use EntopNG to have more visibility about the traffic. And you can also dump the traffic to disk to pick up files um, using, for instance, our EntoDisk and I'd analyze this traffic using Wireshark if you want to drill down up to the packet level and see uh, how the packets look like and what are they, I don't know, in case of TCP attacks, you want to see the flags, you want to see uh, the payload, you want to see who is the source and destination, and so on. So the protection mechanisms include um, active verification of TCP sessions and also DNS sessions. So when there is an attack, when an attack is detected by Nscrub, it starts uh, manipulating the, the traffic, let's say. So it starts challenging the victim, for instance, uh, to make sure that the TCP sessions are legitimate. There are also DNS anti-spoofing mechanisms uh, 
to make sure that uh, DNS requests are generated by uh, a legitimate client um, because yeah, DNS is usually used to 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 run the DOS attacks, the DOS attacks because um, DNS over UDP it's what we call fire and forget. Uh, that means it's UDP. It's UDP. It doesn't require a session, so you just send a request with uh, a spoofed IP address, and the server, the DNS server, just uh, send an answer to the victim. And there are mechanisms for avoiding this, uh, verifying the source. Uh, we also, NSCAP supports blacklisting, whitelisting, uh, filtering like uh, ACLs, so you can drop or discard or accept based on the protocol, on the port, or I don't know, ICMP type. Uh, um, and SCAP can do pattern matching. So for instance, you can filter uh, HTTP based on HTTP requests or uh, uh, the HTTP headers. Um, it supports rate limiting based on source destination protocol. And as I said, you can extend it with plugins. If you want to deploy NSCRAB, as I said, you can do that as transparent bridge in line with your traffic. In this case, NSCRAB supports uh, the ar hardware bypass adapters. Uh, this is really useful to handle not just failover, so hardware failures or software failures, but also maintenance mode. So when you have to update the box or restart the machine, you don't have downtimes. Or you can use diversion techniques. So for instance, with NSCRAB in routing mode, you can divert the traffic for a specific victim when under attack. So you use, I don't know, maybe NTOPMG for the detection, and when you notice that there is an attack, the traffic is exceeding some threshold or something like that, you divert the traffic through NSCRAB and reject the traffic uh, the scrub traffic, so just the legitimate traffic to, to the internal net. Okay, so we have seen, <clears throat> to wrap up, um, we have seen that cyber attacks, security threats are evolving. The number of attacks is increasing and also the traffic is changing because we have seen, um, we see more and more encrypted traffic we have seen how we improved the top NG to, to handle this traffic. So we are uh, adding more security oriented intelligence uh, in the top NG. And uh, we are adding more traffic analysis features in the top NG to be able to, especially to analyze and clear the traffic, understand what's going on, uh, even if traffic is not clear and clear. Um, in addition to, to the threat intelligence, uh, which is able to discover security threats or, I don't know, misbehaving or compromises devices in our network, with NSCRAB we can also protect the perimeter from external attacks. So, uh, as I mean, as next step, actually, what we are currently doing before, besides improving in TopNG with this threat intelligence, with this uh, security centric uh, analysis uh, is to work to a closer integration of NSCRAB and TopNG in order to be able to push protection policies uh, from NTOPNG as soon as an issue uh, has been detected. Uh, okay, so I want to take this opportunity to announce a few events that are coming. Uh, in the coming weeks, um, we will go live with, uh, with a webinar, the 24th of November, uh, where we will present the new software releases. We released uh, almost all the software that we have on the suite in the last weeks. So we want to present the new features. And uh, we will have a couple of training days the 3rd of December and the 10th of December, we will we'll talk about uh, in the first training day, we will talk about NTOPNG with real use cases. So 
so that you can learn how to use it. And in the second day, we'll talk about uh, traffic monitoring with Mpro, for instance, and traffic recording with N2Disk. Uh, anyway, you can find more details in the coming days on our website, on top.org. And here I leave a couple of links, uh, of course, our website and our Discord server, which is what we use now for the community and also a little bit of support and our Telegram server uh, uh, channel, sorry. 